How did Jamal Bowman's underdog campaign manage to unseat New York Congressman Elliot Engel? Well, Elliot Engel's gaffes and policy record helped, but Daniel Marins writes that Bowman having the infrastructure to act on his missteps was the key. Daniel is a politics reporter at HuffPost and joins us now via Skype to discuss Bowman's race. Welcome Good to see you, Dan. Dan. Great to be here, guys. Absolutely. So, Dan, uh, tell us a little bit about your reporting. You covered this race really in and out. I mean, there were a lot of interesting steps along the way. We covered, of course, Elliot Engel's hot mic moment and much of that. But you're talking and want to emphasize on the infrastructure that brought Jamal Bowman to power. Tell us about that. How did that happen? So two years ago in June 2018, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez shocked the world in New York. And she really did it with the exception of the final weeks of her campaign on a shoestring budget with limited national uh, media exposure and really with uh, no presence on the television airwaves. She had a very famous viral ad that was exclusively online. And two years later and many different election cycles, frankly, most of them in many, you know, at the congressional level, especially losing cycles, you have a kind of a new crop of talented, experienced political professionals and companies that really are more equipped to service these kinds of candidates. You also obviously have a different environment. But just to give you an example, within Bowman's first week, he had raised more money than Ocasio-Cortez had raised in her first six months. He was working with a fundraising firm that had you know, that was founded by a guy who had run the finances on Abdul El Sayed's campaign, uh, which was a losing Michigan gubernatorial campaign. But he actually mm -hmm. did raise a lot of money. Right. And so that was one one area. And of course, polling and the advent of the organization Data for Progress and the ability to identify that district as a vulnerable one through quantifiable data and then measure Bowman's performance over the course of time was was really a critical improvement there and that polling proved relatively accurate if not conservative in in uh in bowman's favor that's interesting yeah so and dan one of the through lines here is is justice democrats and particularly some of the people that were involved in in aoc's re race you know the head of justice democrats alexandra rojas kind of ran the field operation or digital operation for uh, for AOC, Waleed Shaheed, a high-ranking high official at Justice Democrats, was actually AOC's kind of first staffer that Justice Democrats detailed uh, to her campaign. What was Justice Democrats' role from the very beginning uh, up until the end in this campaign? Right, and I, and I should just add to that that Rojas in particular and a number of her other co-founders uh, at Justice Democrats, some of whom are no longer there, got their start on Bernie Sanders' 2016 campaign. So there's really an even, even deeper through line, though I would argue, and, and we could get to this later, they have improved on some of Sanders' shortcomings, sort of his unwillingness to embrace uh, rail policy campaign style. But it, really in 2018, they, you know, when the first uh, election cycle, when Justice Democrats was really playing ball, they were just sort of like, we're going to, we're going to try to replace everybody in Congress with better Democrats and we'll endorse people taking on Republicans. We'll endorse people launching primary challenges in all kinds of districts and all they endorsed more than 70 candidates. And they really. But, you know, when when things came down to the wire ahead of Ocasio-Cortez's race, they they figured out that they this was a one promising person and they really needed to embed with her. So coming off of that, they switched gears a little bit. They decided they were going to narrow their focus to supporting primary challengers in, in really solidly Democratic seats and focus on a handful of them. Obviously, they were very active in Marie Newman's race, where they had the partnership of mainstream liberal groups opposed to Rep, uh, Dan Lipinski's anti-abortion and, and anti-gay voting record. They, they came within inches in, in South Texas, where Jessica Cisneros, a young attorney, was taking on veteran conservative Democrat Henry Cuellar. And really, w Bowman's race was kind of in the in the background un until the quarantine and then May and then the revelations uh, about Angle being outside of his district and and uh, ultimately the, the hot mic moment that really allowed it to take off. But 
just a couple things that I think distinguish justice Democrats here. They have multiple different legal structures at their disposal. They're effectively, in some senses, a vendor that offers for-profit services. They are also a PAC that is capable of coordinating with a candidate, but, but is very limited in how it can financially contribute. And then this time around, they erected a, an independent expenditure set up, something called a hybrid carry PAC. But for all intents and purposes, it was a super PAC. And the reason I think the, these different features are important is because we're not actually talking about a member-driven activist organization. We're talking about a grassroots-funded left-wing organization that is nimble, is engaged in innovation, trial and error, just to see what works. Where other coalitions, labor unions, candidates have to rely on old modes of thinking or older stakeholders that have a particular way of conducting politics, this is an organization whose sole raison d'etre is to replace moderate Democrats with more left-wing Democrats in Congress. And they, they, they've, they've been forced on a very limited budget to punch above their weight. And I think that's, that's a lot of what we're seeing here. So that's really interesting, Dan. I mean, also, let's talk about the Congressional Black Caucus, right? One of the things that Crystal highlighted a lot here on the show was that the Congressional Black Caucus went in for Elliot Engel, which is kind of wild when you think about it. But how are they ready to deal with the fact that one of their members is so fundamentally opposed to the way that they do politics? Well, it's a good question, and I would say it's not just one of their members at this point. As, you know, mm-hmm. assuming you know the, the all but certainty that that Bowman is, is going to be headed to this next Congress, he'll be joining, of course, Ilhan Omar and Ayanna Presley. Who, you know, though we know there are distinctions with Presley, there, those are people who uh, have demonstrated a willingness to exercise power independent of Democratic Party leadership. And even though the Congressional Black Caucus contains a mix of moderate conservative Democrats and progressive Democrats, pretty much even the progressive Democrats, figures like Barbara Lee and Maxine Waters and Bonnie Watson Coleman, don't really break too much with Speaker Pelosi. And that's, I think, what distinguishes Presley Omar and a figure like Bowman. I think we're seeing that they want to, the the Black Caucus wants to demonstrate that it is uh, supporting Black candidates now in other races. I understand they have a a, a, a press call either later today or, or at some time this week about about the races where they are getting involved. But the reality is, is that the Congressional Black Caucus PAC has always been somewhat separate from the the individual rank and file members. I know that Keith Ellison, when he was in Congress in 2016, was publicly angry at them for endorsing Hillary Clinton without sort of right. gathering the input of their members. And the, the PAC board is stacked with corporate lobbyists, and it's run by Gregory Meeks, a congressman from New York, who succeeded Joe Crowley as head of the Queen's Democratic machine and is considered one of Wall Street's uh, favorite con- members of Congress. So, look, I, I, I'm sure that they are trying to adjust the, the aesthetics, the appearances, the politics of this. But at the end of the day, if a figure like Congressman Meeks is in charge, then Uh, they still think that they don't need to make fundamental changes. And frankly, given their success in terms at the state level and at the borough wide level, even in New York City, uh, the Queens district attorney race comes to mind. They may think that that they really can just ride this out. Can you talk real quickly uh, about the Working Families Party in New York and what their role was in this uh, the, the Bowman Bowman angle race? Yeah, the Working Families Party is a pretty interesting organization because it's really, it's really, it, its main role has been at the state and local level, really building a progressive bench, and 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 laying the groundwork for figures like Jamani Williams, the New York City Public Advocate, who is likely to be a candidate to take on a, either Governor Cuomo or succeed uh, Bill De Blasio, really kind of the face in some ways of the institutional left in New York City, um, and. They did not get in on the ground floor with Bowman in the sense that they were part of the recruitment process, but they were a very early endorser going back to February before he was really on the national radar. And I think they really played an instrumental role in bringing mainstream imprimatur for Bowman, a relatively mainstream. We're not talking about Emily's list like in the Cisneros race, but 
figures like Jumani Williams coming in as early as February. Uh, I'm, my understanding is that they help smooth the path for the New York State Nurses Union to endorse Jamal Bowman, which was a huge win. And of course, behind the scenes, Sochi Nemica, who is the head of the New York Working Families Party, was in close talks with Andam Gebregorgis to get him out of the race. He was a progressive competitor to Jamal Bowman. So mm-hmm. we're really sort of seeing them play a role as kind of a, a lefty uh, disciplinarian sort of coalition builder. And then finally, they, they, they contributed uh, in no small part 400 grand to the super PAC that, that went on the air and ultimately uh, was, was airing ads unanswered blasting angle for more than a week in a period that even the Democratic majority for Israel concedes now w- was really critical. Well, really important points there, Dan. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it, man. Very welcome. Absolutely. Next on Rising, the Trump campaign senior communications director, Mark Lauder, responds to a senior GOP operatives who are raising concerns about the president's reelection chances from not just senior GOP operatives, but many others, including reportedly Trump himself. That when Rising continues. <laughs> 